Hey, good morning again. All right, all right. Um, <clears throat> this was a, uh, um, the topic today is the sign, and as you, as you, you know, heard from, from the scripture reading, um, it has to do with the Sabbath. And as I was struggling to put something together here, if you've ever tried to do this, you find out that there is such a volume of material that can be presented on the Sabbath. There is such a volume of passages and texts that can be, uh, be used to prove the validity of the Sabbath that we couldn't do it today. We couldn't do it in the time that we have. And um, so I'm trying to narrow the scope, and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay. But I definitely need to ask for the Lord's guidance again this morning. Father in heaven, I pray this, this morning that uh, you will wash me and make me white as snow, purge me with hyssop, take away my sin, Lord, I pray that you will be able to um, take these ideas, meditations, the words, and bless them, that you can feed your people. And so, Lord, I ask for your blessing. I ask for your guidance. I want to submit to your leading and your guidance today. Use me as you see fit. And Lord, put thoughts into my mind that you want me to share. So I thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for being with us, for blessing us with your Holy Spirit. I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Back in January, some of you may recall that we did a study on miraculous deceptions as a method by which Satan causes the majority of the world to defy God, to align themselves with himself, in his great rebellion against God. And then in March, we started a study of the two great errors that Satan uses to deceive the world. And the two great errors, and I'm going to read it again, that, that paragraph from Great Controversy, page 588, uh, this powerful statement says, through the two great errors, the immortality of the soul, and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former, immortality of the soul, lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. And the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, and they, those two, will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power and under this influence of this threefold union, this country, the United States, will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. Powerful statement. In March then, we covered the error of the immortality of the soul and how it will be used to convince the world that the Sabbath was actually changed to Sunday. Evil angels posing as our dead loved ones will appear and work miracles of healing to gain trust and credibility. And then they will make pronouncements contradicting scripture and declaring that the seventh day Sabbath was changed to Sunday. And many will believe this deception thinking that the miracles that they are seeing are of God and that therefore these messengers must be speaking truth. So today, we're going to look a little bit at the biblical Sabbath. We're going to look at the origin and how it is the sign of God's people. And it's a sign of their relationship with him. You know, 2 Timothy says that scripture is profitable for doctrine and correction. And Solomon in Ecclesiastes sums this up. He says, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, 
For this is the whole duty of man. Now, interestingly enough, that this idea, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, is repeated in the first angel message. Did you, did you ever catch that, that they are related to each other? The first angel's message of Revelation 14, 6 and 7 says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God. Give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And where have we heard that before? It's the fourth commandment. So it's clear from these that all men are obligated. They're duty bound to keep the commandments of God. And at the very last verse of the three angels message, it identifies who those are who are God's people. Here's the patience of the saints. Here's those who endure. The endurance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Okay, so you see that the commandments of God are critical and we must know. We must know about them. We must know them and be able to defend them. So it's clear that we're obligated to keep the commandments of God, which include worship of the Creator, whose creative acts are described in the fourth commandment. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Why? We've got a reason. For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that is in them. There's a reason given for why God asks us, commands us, directs us to observe the seventh day Sabbath. You know, that call of the first angel of Revelation 14 explains that we give glory to God by obedience to his commandments. And by demonstrating the true worship of the Creator. We give Him glory. We bring glory to Him when we participate in this activity, when we honor this day. And that demonstration of the true worship of the Creator in legal terminology must be open and notorious. In other words, people need to be able to see it. It must be observable. And we must be able to defend it from Scripture. And as I mentioned as we started here, we don't have time to do that exhaustive study. <laughs> okay. But I'm fairly confident that we don't need to convince any of you of the sacredness of the seventh day Sabbath, or you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> You know, the first time the Sabbath is mentioned in scriptures, it's called the seventh day. And we find this in Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, which tell us that on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, and I put in parentheses, sanctified it. Okay? This means that it was set aside for a holy purpose. And one of the ways in which Satan has attempted to obliterate the Sabbath as God's holy day has been through attacks on the literal seventh day, seven day creation story. If it's just a nice allegory, and it's not literal, then there is no real seventh day to identify. There's nothing at all that's very important about 
the seventh day of any week. The widespread adoption of evolutionary theory has completely discredited the seven-day creation. And this may come as a surprise to you. Even the Pope is accepting of theistic evolution. In 2014, Pope Francis was quoting, I forgot now, the 12th, which was the 12th Pope, anyway, from 1950 or something. But he was saying that evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion, notion of creation. And his words, he's warning against thinking of God's act of creation as, quote, God being a magician with a magic wand be able to, being able to do everything, close quote. What? And close the, and the quote again here. And so creation continued for centuries and centuries, millennia and millennia, until it became what we know today, close quote. Multiple popes have commented that believing in material evolution is acceptable. The people are free to believe in any theory of creation. They can even believe in a literal seven-day creation or evolution through eons as long as the people believe that the immortal soul is created by God and not the product of evolution. Okay? All right. See, see, and so, so this, this is, this is, uh, you know, was news to me. Okay, when I was researching this. But you see that the immortality of the soul is already attacking the Sabbath. Okay, it's already being used to attack the Sabbath, and so these two things are just so closely tied together by the adversary. Okay, so. The conclusion is that since there's no definitive creation timeline in theistic evolution, it becomes perfectly acceptable to pick any other day to worship on. Okay? Most Christians today believe that the seventh day Sabbath was imposed upon the Jews at Sinai and that it has no significance or application to non Jewish people. They accept without question that Sunday is the Sabbath of the Bible, and their ministers expound upon the necessity of keeping it holy. Those who are aware of the fourth commandment and know what it says merely use it as a guide to the proper observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, what you should or can and can't do or should or shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath. And in fact, both the Catholic Catechism and the Lutheran Catechism list the Sabbath commandment as the third commandment because they did away with the one about not having any graven images okay, and moved the fourth commandment up to take its place. So their, their commandments in the catechisms read this way. The third commandment per the Catholic Catechism says, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Lutheran Catechism that I have is 100 years old, so I don't know if it's still the same, <laughs> but what it says is, thou shalt sanctify the holy day. That's it. Notice that neither of these abbreviated commandments explain why it is important to keep the day holy. The complete fourth commandment, as we mentioned, does give a reason for, because... In six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and rested the seventh day. So what's the reason that's given? Because God created, he completed it in six days, he rested on the seventh day, he blessed it, and he hallowed it. He, that means he sanctified it, he made it holy, he set it aside for special use. You know, the ex Exodus 20 Verse 11, which is the, uh, this verse of, of, the, of the fourth commandment, is a short history lesson. Okay? And what it's supposed to do is to cause us to go back and recall 
creation. To review the creation story, it commands us to remember the Sabbath day. Not just the one that's coming up this week. The Sabbath day on which God rested. Remember that day. Because it's critically important that we understand what God is trying to help us know. In Genesis 2, chapter 2, or chapter two verse 2, we find the first mention of a seventh day, which becomes the Sabbath day. And it says, and on the seventh day, God had ended his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So recognizing and honoring the Sabbath helps us remember that God is the creator. That he is the ruler of this world. An interesting passage again from a paragraph or two from Great Controversy, page 437 comments on this issue. She says, it says, the importance of the Sabbath as the memorial of creation is that it keeps ever present the true reason why worship is due to God. Because he is the creator and we are his creatures. The Sabbath, therefore, lies at the very foundation of divine worship for it teaches this great truth. The creator creature relationship. It teaches this great truth in the most impressive manner and no other institution does this. The true ground of divine worship, not of that on the Sabbath day merely, but of all worship, is found in the distinction between the creator and his creatures. This great fact can never become obsolete and must never be forgotten. It was to, and this is, this, is, this is really powerful, it was to keep this truth ever before the minds of men that God instituted the Sabbath in Eden to preserve the memory of the creator-created relationship. Okay? Okay, so it was to keep this truth ever before the minds of men that God instituted the Sabbath in Eden and so long as the fact that he is our creator, continues to be a reason why we should worship him, just so long the Sabbath will continue as its sign and memorial. Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the creator as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. The keeping of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to the true God. The sign of loyalty. So you can see why it is that the Sabbath is the objective and focus of the enemy. Because the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty and he is disloyal. And he wants everybody else to be disloyal. He aims to cause all humans to commit acts of disloyalty to God such that they will be condemned and excluded from heaven. That's the objective. Seventh day Sabbath observance is a sign of loyalty to God. It's an identifying marker of who are God's people. Who are they? How can you tell? Now, as we, we said before earlier, the, the, the fourth commandment says hallowed. God hallowed the seventh day. The creation story in Genesis 2 says he sanctified it. So clearly, they're talking about the same thing. Okay? And when we look up the definition of the word sanctify, we find that it means, one, to set aside, set apart to a sacred purpose or religious use. It also means to make free from sin, to purify. And it also means to impart or impute sacredness. So when God sanctified, when God hallowed the Sabbath, he was setting it aside for sacred use that would in turn cause the keeper of that day to become sanctified. Okay, 
And using that second definition, those people would become purified from sin and have a sacred purpose. The Sabbath is to facilitate that process. And if we look, and we've already read this, Luke, I'm sorry, Exodus 31, 12 and 13. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily you shall keep my Sabbath, for it, the Sabbath, is a sign between me and throughout your generations that you may know that I am Jehovah who sanctifies you. And about six centuries later, the prophet Ezekiel repeats the same sentiment. He says, Moreover, this is God speaking, also, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am Jehovah that sanctifies them. And notice that it's God talking here and he declares that he is the one who sanctifies his people. And that the Sabbath is a sign that he has sanctified or is in the process even of sanctifying them. So God set his Sabbath keepers apart as the one that's identified as his special people. And by their obedience to his commandment, they proclaim then and demonstrate their loyalty. It appears that God sanctifies his people by giving them an opportunity to obey and the strength to do so by the power of his spirit. I find it interesting that both Exodus and Ezekiel state that God's objective in giving the Sabbath is so that you, or they, meaning his people, you might know that he is the one who sanctifies you. That's an interesting, so that you can know that God is sanctifying you, God gave you the Sabbath. So that you can know something. So that you can learn something. Because God is the one who sets you apart. For sacred purposes. For holy things. For holy work. Deuteronomy 7 says, verse 6 through 8 says, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people unto himself. Above all the people that are on the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because of your own inherent... <laughs> uh, can't think of the word. word yeah, yeah, okay. Your, your own inherent... Um, Worthiness, yeah. He didn't choose you for that. You weren't more numerous than others. You were the fewest. He chose you then, verse 8, but because the Lord loved you. He chose you because he loved you and because he was keeping a promise. Because he would keep his oath, which he had sworn to your father's. Honoring God's Sabbath, then, is the sign that we as individuals have consented to and accept being among God's people with its duties and its responsibilities. You know, I believe it's commonly accepted in Christianity, generally, that Jesus lived an exemplary life. And by that, I mean a life intended to be an example to be followed. Okay. And this was illustrated recently in the, about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, about the WWJD fad. What would Jesus do? Bracelets and necklaces and hats and t-shirts and so forth. You remember that? So when you're confronted by those who question your sanctification, when they question your obedience to the Sabbath command, you can simply ask, what would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? You know what Jesus would do because of what he did do.
The Bible's clear. Luke 4, verse 16, so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Clearly, the example of Jesus was to be in church and be worshiping on the Sabbath, on the seventh day Sabbath. And he demonstrated what it looked like then to be sanctified, to be set aside for holy purposes. It was clearly God's will that Jesus keep the Sabbath because Jesus himself said, I do always the will of my Father. Everything Jesus did was the will of his Father. So it was the will of the Father that he observed the Sabbath. In his confrontations with the Pharisees over what constituted proper Sabbath observance, Jesus emphasized that true Sabbath keeping involved mercy and concern for others. And last time when we were talking about the miracles, we mentioned the crippled woman that Jesus healed in church. He criticized the leaders for having more sympathy for their livestock than for a human being. He said in Luke 13, 16, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound low these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? As the sign of sanctification, the Sabbath is to be a day of grace. Not just from God to us, but from us to others, to those around us. And I can't remember where I read this story, and I can't remember enough of the details, but I, can, I, can, I think I can <clears throat> talk about it a little bit. The story that I read was about an Adventist businessman who ran a gas station in a one gas station town. In honor of the Sabbath day, he closed his business every week. And one Sabbath day, a traveler came through town on an emergency trip. He needed to get to the next town, and he was out of gas. Upon inquiry, he was able to locate the Adventist businessman and explained his situation, asking if he could get some fuel. Our pious Adventist said, don't you know it's the Sabbath? I don't do business on the Sabbath. I can't sell you any gas. You'll have to wait till after sundown. For that traveler, the Sabbath became a burden and an obstacle. What if our, if our gentleman had said, I don't do business on the Sabbath. I can't sell you any gas, but I can give you a couple of gallons to get you where you need to go. Grace and mercy on the Sabbath. Would the Sabbath have become a sign of grace and mercy to this traveler? Yes, it would have. Would Jesus have freely given what he had on Sabbath? Yes, he did. And he would have. The Sabbath could have been a sign of grace. John chapter 1 proclaims... <clears throat> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And verse 14 says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, thus establishing that Jesus was the Creator God in Eden. He was the one who rested on the seventh day. He was the creator of the Sabbath. And that's why Jesus claimed authority over Sabbath issues. He knew what he was talking about. <laughs> it was his day. It was the Lord's day. See, so he's in, 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 uh, <clears throat> in addressing some criticisms, he's, he said... <clears throat> The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. 
So man was not made to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made to serve us, to give us something invaluable. Because he is the creator of the Sabbath, he is the Lord of the Sabbath. It is his day. It's the Lord's day because he made it, and he knows what it's for. And so he told them, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. That was a dramatic statement. Because he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so therefore, because I'm the creator of the Sabbath, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Okay? I know what it was made for. I made it. Okay? That is what he was claiming there. And that's just, just an a absolutely revolutionary, heretical thing for him to say in their hearing, at least from their viewpoint, okay? Because they did not recognize or refused to recognize he, who he was. And so what Jesus said here is he created the Sabbath for all mankind. He was not making it only for Jews. The Sabbath pre-existed the nation of Israel. The Sabbath pre-existed Judaism and pre-existed the nation of the Jews of his day. His intent in creating the Sabbath was that all humans would remain his and would remain sanctified, dedicated, set aside for the purposes that God had designed for them. And the nation of Israel then and the Jewish nation that followed were to show their desire to be God's people by their Sabbath observance. It was to be a sign that they were his and he was their God. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 tells us that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. And in Malachi 3, 6, the creator God announced, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So when he says, I am the Lord, when the creator God says, I am the Lord, who is saying that? It's Jesus, because he's the creator God. Okay. <clears throat> so if you ask somebody what it means when something is written in stone, what does it mean? It means that it, what's written cannot be changed. So then you can ask, what does it mean when God writes something in stone with his own finger? What does it mean when God writes something in stone? And the passage says, he changes not. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. We can count on it that God is the same. He does not change. The prophet Isaiah confirms this. Chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I make shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. How many? All flesh. The entire universe worships God from one Sabbath to another. You know, the book of Hebrews is Paul's exposition on how the ministry of Jesus was prefigured and foreshadowed by the sanctuary services that were established by Moses in the wilderness. And he talks about how Jesus' ministry is better than that. Okay? That these things, the sanctuary, was not the whole, not the real thing. It was an illustration. It was a sandbox, diorama, diagram to try and get you thinking and get God's people thinking in the right direction and to trust God. So here 
he's speaking about the ministry of the priests as being after the example and shadow of heavenly things. And he says, Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, quoting God, for, and this is quoting Exodus also, for see, saith he, God, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed you in the mount. Close quote. All the articles of the furniture, and if you go back there and you read, you read the uh, descriptions, okay, all the articles of the furniture were described meticulously to Moses by God himself. And they were to follow the patterns of the heavenly things in extreme detail. And the word translated as pattern has the implications of plans, resemblance, a sampler, a model intended to be imitated, copied. Okay? Those are the kind of the, 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 the meanings of that word. It was translated as patterns. Clearly, Moses was to create an ark that closely copied the model of the one in heaven that he was shown because it was to demonstrate to the people what the heavenly ark was like and what it was used for. Paul makes it clear that the earthly sanctuary and its furniture are just examples of the true sanctuary in heaven. He tells us that Jesus became our high priest at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven and he is a minister of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle, the real one, which the Lord pitched and not man. The one that was pitched by man was just an illustration. Moses received the Ten Commandments from the hand of God and he was instructed by God that those tables of stone written with the finger of God were to be placed in the ark which he had been instructed to build. Exodus 25, 16, Moses is told, And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. And throughout the rest of the Exodus, the ark is identified as the ark of the testimony. Because Moses did as he was directed and he put the two tables of stone, the testimonies written by the finger of God, into the ark and he placed the mercy seat over top of them. Now there's all kinds of illustrative symbology and meaning in that. Okay. It's in Revelation 11:19 that the Apostle John sees in vision, sees the ark in vision and seeing the activity before the throne of God he's, he sees into the sanctuary the temple of God which God built and not man and it says and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in, in the temple in it in his temple I should say the ark of his testament if Moses ark was a copy of the one in, in heaven as Paul declares what was, must we conclude is in the Ark of the Testament that John saw in heaven? If he was to copy that specifically and that close, we can only conclude that in the Ark in heaven is the law of God. Amen. Clearly, the law of God is safely preserved in its original state in the temple in heaven. He has not rewritten it or authorized anyone to do so. But God predicted through the prophet Daniel that there would come a power on this earth that would think he could do so and pretend to do so. But just because he claims to do so doesn't mean he can In these last days, God's people are to be proclaiming the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. All three of them are messages about worship. The first message calls the world back to the worship of the Creator. And it's a quote, as we said before, directly from the fourth commandment, Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. If you haven't memorized that, please do. <laughs> please do. How are we to give glory to God? By accepting and honoring the sign of sanctification, 
which is his Sabbath day. The third angel warns of the consequences of not being among the sanctified of the first angel's message, not being among those sanctified who are worshiping God as he has commanded. Those who receive the mark or the sign of the beast are those who acknowledge the beast's authority and worship him and his image. Those who refuse to receive and acknowledge the Sabbath of God refuse the seal of God. And they receive the mark, the seal of the enemy, in their foreheads or in their hands. Those who receive the seal of God in their foreheads have made a conscious decision to be sanctified to be set aside for holy purpose, for holy use by God. They have made a conscious decision to do that. They have made a life-sacrificing decision. It's a life where Jesus said, <clears throat> well, you must die self. That's a sac life sacrificing decision. And we must be agreeable to be used by God in whatever capacity he desires. And that may not be comfortable. That may not be comfortable. But we submit to it anyway. And as we get close to the end here, as things start to wind up, it is not going to be comfortable to worship God on the Sabbath day. In fact, it's going to become a life-sacrificing decision that we would rather die than look disloyal to God then be disloyal to God. Paul reminds us in Hebrews that the earthly sanctuary, the furniture and the equipment were made holy and sanctified, set aside, dedicated for service to God by the application of the blood of animals, which cannot purify. But those items those beings, those people destined to be used in the tabernacle of God in heaven are cleaned and dedicated by the application of the blood of the Son, Jesus Christ. His blood cleanses. His blood purifies and sanctifies. And by the washing of the blood of Jesus, we are proclaimed sanctified, not only dedicated, but purified, and being used as instruments in his will. We're given the opportunity to acknowledge that status, that we want that status, that we want to be his, that we want to be sanctified for his use and that we will allow him to use us in every way. We're given that opportunity and we're given then the opportunity to demonstrate that status when we accept the gift of God that was made for us at creation. And people will tell you, oh, you're just a legalist if you keep the Sabbath. No. Sabbath observance is not to be used to earn salvation. Just like all the other works that we are called to do. Let, uh, it says, do your good works so that men may see them and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven because they see what you are doing and it honors God. 
Same thing with the Sabbath here. The Sabbath is not to earn any place or any position. The Sabbath is to be a demonstration of what our relationship with God is. And he is glorified by that. Verily you shall keep my Sabbath. It's a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that we can have confidence that God sanctifies us, that he sanctifies you. What an opportunity, what a privilege it is to be able to do something so obvious, so plain, that says, he's my God, and I trust him. I trust him. We may get into the uh, other things on the Sabbath and Sunday issues sometime in the future, but um, if any of you have questions, I'd be willing to, to, to take those. Let's close with a word of prayer. Let's give thanks to Father. Father, so, we're so grateful to you. That we receive from you righteousness. That we receive from you sanctification. That we don't have to work to earn it. That we can just claim your promise. That you are willing to forgive. That you are willing to, to cleanse. That you are willing to take up residence in each scoundrelly heart. And that you will transform it. And so, Lord, we pray that as we, as we uh, worship on this day, we pray that you will be glorified through your people, that you will be glorified through us, and that we will acknowledge that you are our God that sanctifies us, and we can have peace with you, and that we can share with the world our commitment our faith, our trust in you by a mere outward observance. So Lord, we pray now that you will bless your people, that this Sabbath day will be a witness to you and that we will be a witness to you. And Lord, help us to be gracious and merciful like you are on this day of grace and mercy is our prayer now today in Jesus' name. Amen.